Thank you so much, Eliana. And thank you to everyone here at the Center for Fiction who's helped put this together, as well as Susanna Porter on the board and Christina Baker Klein on the Writers' Council uh, for their enthusiasm in promoting this idea. Um, so tonight marks the second event in an occasional series called Creative Writing and Critical Thought. Um, the, the series is, is exploring the relationship between the public and academic contexts of the literary arts bringing together novelists and poets with literary theorists and literary historians. Creative writing and critical thought will create a series of lively and in-depth conversations about the state of literary practice and study in contemporary American culture. Um, so it's appropriate that the series is being co-sponsored by a public-facing institution like the Center for Fiction in Brooklyn and an academic journal like New Literary History. Um, and I've been the editor of New Literary History since my colleague Rita Felsky uh, stepped down about five years ago. Published by Johns Hopkins University Press and based at the University of Virginia, NLH has long featured the world's most prominent scholars of literary theory and history. Our many contributors over the years have included Jacques Derrida, Gayatri Spivak, Judith Butler, Henry Louis Gates Jr., Bruno Latour, Sarah Ahmed, and many others. Um, the journal has always fostered rigorous analysis and critique of literary practices from the ancient world to the present moment. This series hopes to spark lively conversations between some of the most prominent and influential literary theorists and the most admired and challenging writers of fiction and poetry working today. The conversations that result will be published in NLH as well as online, creating a living record of dialogues among, among a variety of writers and theorists thinking together about the nature and role of creative practice. Our first event was last, last October. It was held in person in Brooklyn. It featured the novelist Garth Greenwell in conversation with Carolyn Dinshaw, one of the leading figures in LGBTQ studies and queer theory. That dialogue will be published in the next issue of New Literary History in just a few weeks, and we'll make it available on the center's website as well. Tonight's conversation, which we've given the title Translation in Theory and Imagination, features the novelist Katie Kitamura, whose books think in lively and vivid ways about interpretation, translation, and the interplay of languages and voices, and Emily Apter, whose many books on the theory and practice of translation have shaped an entire academic field devoted to these provocative subjects. Their conversation too will appear in the journal's pages in the months ahead, and I'm thrilled to introduce them to you tonight. Emily Apter is Silver Professor of French Literature, Thought and Culture and Comparative Literature. She's Chair of Comparative Lit at New York University. Her books include Unexceptional Politics on Obstruction Impasse and the Impolitic, Against World Literature on the Politics of Untranslatability and the Translation Zone, a new comparative literature, among others. Her current project, What is Just Translation, takes up questions of translation and justice across media. Her many essays have appeared in such forums as Public, Public Culture, Diacritics, October, PMLA, Comparative Literature, Art Forum, Critical Inquiry, and very soon, New Literary History. In 2019, she was the Daimler Fellow at the American Academy in Berlin, and she served as president of the American Comparative Literature Association. In 2003, she was the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship. Katie Kitamura's most recent novel is Intimacies. One of the New York Times 10 best books of 2021 and one of Barack Obama's favorite books of 2021, it was long listed for the National Book Award and the Joyce Carol Oates Prize. Her third novel, A Separation, was a finalist for the Premio Van Renorzi and a New York Times notable book. She's also the author of Gone to the Forest and The Long Shot, both finalists for the New York Public Library's Young Lions Fiction Award. Her work has been translated into 19 languages and is being adapted for film and television. She's a recipient of numerous fellowships and she's written for publications including the New York Times Book Review, the New York Times, The Guardian, Granta, Bomb, Triple Canopy, and the list goes on. She teaches in the creative writing program also at New York University. Um, so it's a real pleasure to have you both here, Katie and Emily. And with that, I'll step away with thanks to our speakers and to all of you for being here for this event. Thank you, Bruce. Um, Thank you, Bruce. Yes, and to the Center for Fiction for hosting this event and for giving us a chance to meet each other. It was wonderful. Um, I think I'm going to kick off and with the understanding that Katie is going to 
bracket us uh, in the conclusion. Yes, I want to. <laughs> I'm going to start by saying um, what a pleasure it is to be in dialogue with you. Um, I felt like I was discovering in some ways a literary alter ego. Um, and thinking about this, I, you're a writer who works with a translator protagonist in two of your novels, A Separation and Intimacies. I'm a critic whose work has focused on translation theory, as Bruce mentioned. And you put translation theory very much into play by staging scenes of mistranslation, gaps and chasms of meaning. Actually, chasms is a term that comes up in the book uh, in, in really interesting ways. And what I would call plurilingual subjectivity, an experience of existing between languages or in zones where word worlds collide and intermingle. And as a theory-oriented academic with a specialty in comparative literature who spent some years supervising this gigantic book called The Dictionary of Untranslatables, a Philosophical Lexicon, I very much related to the kind of in-translation zones that you described in intimacies where concepts are construed not as sort of big monoliths, but as plastic forms. Um, whose significations shift as they are languaged. I'm using that term unconventionally, but languaging concepts was very much behind uh, the project of the Dictionary of Untranslatables as it was conceived by its original editor, Barbara Cassin. Um, your writing really resonates with me in its understanding of, of translation as a way of being, as an existential condition implicated in the politics of diplomacy, pedagogy, and international and the international administration of justice. And though intimacies is in no way an obvious polemic about the power relations among world languages, it does, I think, in subtle ways, explore how dominant Western languages, reinforced by global economics and institutional law, influence the course of global affairs. And I'm really thinking about this, of course, now and the moment of a European invasion. The post-colonial politics of translation, and the role of translation in shoring up monolingual institutions of communication and the politics of translation that occur at the level of social interactions among interpreters in court, professional interpreters and their clients, all these issues are engaged in intimacies, even if sometimes only on, a, on the oblique. And in so far as these issues have been preoccupations throughout my work, um, I found seeing them come to life in the literary medium incredibly exciting and just want to say thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much, Emily. It's really a joy to be here in dialogue with you. And Bruce, I, I owe you such a debt of gratitude for bringing us together. And thank you also to the Center for Fiction for hosting us and providing this virtual space for us to meet in. You know, I mean, that phrase literary alter ego is so powerful and I think it really feels appropriate. Um, the Dictionary of Untranslatables, which you referred to has really for a long time been a very significant text in our household, or at least amongst the, 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 the literate grown-ups in, in our household. Um, but the more time I spent in the company of your writing and in the company of your thought, the more I kind of kept encountering this wonderful synchronicity um, of thought, which has really been magical to discover. Um, in part because of the structure of the series and of our pairing, I've really been thinking about the relationship between theory and criticism on the one hand and um, the practice of writing fiction, which is obviously my, my day job, so to speak. Um, and I think one thing I, I, I've realized is, is how generative reading your work, for example, has been for me as a writer. Um, it's really clarified the terrain that I'm already looking at as a fiction writer um, in, in, the, in the books that I've written, but it's also indicating new paths that I might go forward into as I as I continue to write and especially now as I'm turning to a new novel that I'm just starting to work on. Um, so I think for me in a lot of ways theory um, and criticism provide a kind of 
armature for my fiction. They provide the kind of basic structure onto which I put character and plot and narrative and style and tone. So they're really fundamental for how I think about structuring fiction. Um, I think with intimacies in particular, this most recent novel, um, I was less interested in using plot to create movement and resolution across the arc of the book. And instead I really thought about um, the movement of the book from start to finish as a kind of movement on the part of the narrator um, in terms of her relationship to language and to interpretation and translation. So at the start of the novel, she's really thinking of herself as an instrument of the court. She thinks of herself, at one point she refers to herself as a consciousness free zone. So she's kind of really thinking of herself in this depersonalized manner. Um, she's thinking of herself almost as a conduit through which language passes without necessarily affecting her and without her affecting the language. And then over the course of the novel, I think that's really problematized for the character. And she comes to see that the transmission of language is much more complicated, that she is changed by the language as she speaks, but similarly that she changes the language as she speaks it. Um, so in some ways, I've really thought about the novel as trying to trouble the notion of seamless translation, which I think is so common in the culture. I mean, I think I'm sure I've used it many times probably in, in reviews or in speaking about a piece of translated fiction. I think I've probably said the seamless trans translation, but I think in this novel, I was actually trying to trouble that notion of a kind of frictionless passage of language from one body to another. And this is really something that you have written about at length in your work and that you've thought about so deeply um, and, and, I, and I think of your work as kind of restoring the friction to translation, if that makes sense. And so I wonder if I could begin by asking you to speak a little bit more about um, the notion of untranslatability, which is really central to both our work, although in quite different ways, um, about the paradigms that it subverts, but also the kind of field of possibility that it opens up. Yes, I get to that in a second, and, but just listening to you now, it, yeah. Suddenly it occurs to me that when I first read the novel, I almost thought that the English that was in it was translated. It had oh. that mark of an elsewhere. That's um, the dream. I that mean, was, Emily, that's the that dream. Was un, yeah. un, unlocalizable. Um, that was, was something in the feel and the distance, almost like being in, you know, palpably either in a space where you're translating mentally or where you're actually reading a text in translation with the sense that maybe it's in another language, maybe that absent or phantom language is somehow there in the way it's written. And it's very hard to pin down, you know, how that effect is generated or where it actually is. But it was, um, you know, especially since I've often done a lot of teaching of texts that are in translation, uh, where we look at, it, it struck me as, oh, this this could almost be a translated text. I don't know if you wanted to just jump in no, there. No, I, I mean, I, I think that's what I, I mean, I, I can't believe you said that. And I'm so grateful to you for saying that. I mean, that's really, I think, what I aspire to try to create in, in my prose. And I think, you know, there's a lot of syntactical things that are um, not standard, I think, in the way I, I structure my sentences, um, which I think can sometimes give people trouble but which is really part of trying to create this effect of of the language having passed through something before it arrives on the page and you know part of doing that is I particularly when I'm writing in this voice I primarily will read fiction in translation so I am reading something that has passed through that kind of double consciousness of 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 the, of the author and the translator and and sometimes in some cases a third trans a third third one as well if it's been translated from original language to English and then out of English into or sorry original language to say French and then out of French into English or something like that but um so that that um that sense of slight alienation from the language is very much something that I'm, I'm hoping to to achieve in the in the prose so thank you for saying that. Well, we'll come back to that. I think this question of the dislocated voice and the dislocated languages. And, um, but just to come back to your question about what is untranslatability. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it started out being um, a kind of graft or 
gloss on a term that was used in this dictionary project of the untranslatable, even though it was under as emphasized uh, in the title of that book. We put it when we translated it into English into the we foregrounded it. And the untranslatable was basically it was a philosophical term that resisted translation or that was translated um, constantly. It is, there wasn't a sort of stable agreed on translation, it was always slipping or it was a term that was had a fascinating history of mistranslation. Um, the big example was the word, the subject, which in English is, you know, the subject of a sentence, the subject of, of the realm. Uh, there are different ways we can think of a topical subject, but the subject in a French sense is le sujet, right? It's an impersonal um, notion of individual or personhood. It doesn't have any, Real equivalent, and um, you think of citizen subjects. So that that was kind of the context was a, was to overturn how we think of concept history by languaging concepts by looking at their translation histories and their mistranslation histories. Mm -hmm. um, what we were interested in, or what I extrapolated, was this idea of untranslatability as a way of doing literary work, and um, it was kind of complicated, but. Um, I was interested in uh, really focusing not on uh, equivalence or similarity and comparative literature that it was a kind of quest for comparability, right? What, what it makes a culture or text universally accessible? How do we connect those points? And that I understand is a very human and humanist project, and I respect it. But it seemed to me, uh, especially in the way world literature was being taught, that it papered over a lot of the roadblocks, mm -hmm. the bumps, the points of difference uh, and opacity that, uh, and it created what I sort of um, have facetiously called kumbaya moments, right? These kinds of uh, celebrations that were often, I thought, uh, cover-ups or disguises for real political differences, for important cultural differences that needed to be explored and that couldn't even be explored by a sensitive teacher who knew a little bit about a culture, but really had to be investigated through some access to an original language, even if you didn't speak it. So these were the sorts of issues that were in my mind. Um, I also was very influenced by Edouard Lisson's notion of the poetics of opacity, um, which were crucial to his idea of poetic relation and of, of the archipelago as, you know, different discrete islands where different languages are spoken, but that are still in some ways cartographically associated. And so, and, and, and these opaque spaces, these places that are un, of ungraspable communication structure the possibilities of expression for Glissant. Um, and very often it's in the inflections of dialect and Creole that are suppressed because they don't conform to standard language, uh, standard grammars or colonial languages that have been imposed. Um, this, the, the, the sort of dialectal, dialectal aspect of language um, comes to the fore, not only in his notion of Caribbean discourse, but really in diasporic communities the world over, in the global south, in what we might think of as an undercommons of slang or dub. I've got my sirens going. <laughs> you warned us about the sirens and here they are, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the only last thing I would kind of say before passing it back to you is that I got into some trouble for that, um, for that against world literature title. People kept taking it in the sense of, oh, you're against translation. Mm -hmm. And I kept having to kind of clarify, no, it's the opposite. Um, but in the work I'm currently engaged in now, there's very much a sense of untranslatability as a term that allows me to look at disappearances in language, whether through ethnic cleansing, linguistic apartheid, the history of apartheid or white, white sovereignty, um, the haunting traces of colonial violence um, that a translation can transmit. And um, I just 
came across this lovely citation from Gayatri Spivak's preface to her translation of Aimé Césaire's A Season in the Congo um, from 1966. It was his text from 66, where she says, translation is the most intimate act of reading and to read is to pray to be haunted. Césaire haunted me as he was in turn haunted by Lumumba, uh, you know, of course, who was assassinated uh, not so long before Aimé Césaire wrote this. Um, so this, this, this kind of violence has also led me to think about translation and justice and how translation actually operates in the courtroom. So a working title I had for our, our dialogue in my mind was interpreters in court. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, but it, and it goes in many directions, but this was one reason I was immediately drawn to your book, Intimacies, but also Separation. Thank you. I mean, Emily, that's such a, such a wonderful, I mean, I, I, you know, I have only recently, to, to my, to my embarrassment, um, come across Glissant, but this idea of the kind of poetics of opacity as, as, as a kind of political and aesthetic strategy of resistance is really powerful. And, and when hearing you talk about the, you know, what, what you, you jokingly call the Kumbaya narrative, I think, and, and, and how you can, insist upon on you know as you said you're not kind of speaking out against translation in any way but you're kind of complicating it in some sense and it really made me think of a of a work um you know and and a lot of my i i, I have many many literary influences but a lot of my influences do kind of come from outside and and are somebody who has influenced me a lot i think is a belgian choreographer jerome bell and he he made a a work that is called um, Pichet Clanchon and myself. And it's a dialogue between him, between Jerome Bell, the Belgian choreographer, and um, Clanchon, who is a Thai dancer and contemporary choreographer, but who is um, very seriously trained in the traditional dance form of Khan. And so the, the, this piece kind of consists of the two dancers sharing the vocabularies of dance that they've been taught. And, and you know, they, they do this in a way that sometimes comes up against moments of mild cultural collision but also moments of real you know that kind of uh the kind of universal accessibility that you you were referencing this idea that there are things that unite us all that we all have in common and and it's you know two things i guess that really struck me about the piece are that one it it uses language it's dance vocabulary it uses building blocks of language as a kind of basis for this connection or communication and then at the very end of the piece there is suddenly this moment of rupture where all of a sudden there's a gap between these two people and these two traditions that just cannot be bridged. Like it, it, it has to remain there. And when you were speaking about, you know, the kind of possibilities of, of violence in translation, it, I, you know, I, I, I went back to, to rewatch it actually before our, our event. And, I, and it's, it's, it's Bell is kind of saying, sometimes in my dance, I take my clothes off and, and he says, like, like this, and at, it's at that moment that 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 um, Clanchin says, no, that this is not okay because of my culture. He says, because of my culture, and Bell says, because of your culture, and he says, because of my culture, and then he says, so I think we are done now, and he gets up and he leaves, and there's a real kind of severing of this narrative of kind of communication and connection, and and there there there's an issue of offense as well that has taken place. So it's it's something that I think really um plays with some of the ideas that that you're talking about in in this in this in this form that makes reference to this to the appeal of universal accessibility and, and gives the audience some of the kind of pleasure of that even as ultimately i think it undercuts it and it points to these spaces of untranslatability or, or opacity i've wanted to give um a, a, the listeners a little sense of the figure of the translator mm -hmm. in your in your text in the in intimacies i was very intrigued by the depiction of the professional interpreter is on the one hand a kind of fixed structure of the international court or neutral part of the machinery um, and on the other hand a subject mm -hmm. mired in force fields of affect can we were just talking about that the affect uh, mm -hmm. that can go wrong the affect mm -hmm. that can become a form of social harming 
um, with the affect, which in some ways I felt you were double channeling, you were translating affect as you were yeah. uh, depicting a narrator translating language, which was from a narrative point of view or a writer's uh, challenge, quite difficult. Um, so, you know, what, what happens is that then this, this the, you give us this very peculiar kind of disorientation that's both social and linguistic. Mm -hmm. um, and the writing also an analyzes along with this complicity and disassociation um, and how the swirl of translated words and worlds kind of unmoors the translator's ethical centeredness. Uh, it's a very, very strong. Um, so it tells the tale, this novel, of a woman interpreter with native fluency in English, Japanese, and French, and um, proficiency in Spanish and German, maybe others too, but those were the ones I took note of. Um, and she's, we track her arrival in The Hague, um, a place she may or may not have visited in early childhood. There's a kind of flashback. Um, and then we follow the narrator's initiation into the protocols of the international court, just kind of taught by this character, uh, Amina, how it, uh, who I guess is Senegalese. She's given some direction um, about um, where she'll translate for suspected terrorists and war criminals. We never really learn her name as far as I could tell, is that correct? Yes. Um, and, or deep, too much detail about her background. Um, and I gathered from talking to you, that was a little discussion with, an, with, one of, with your editor. Yes. Um, she's an I, an I narrator, a first person whose accounts of her experience as an interpreter alternate with descriptions of really kind of mundane things like finding a place to live, finding a boyfriend, failing to find a, a real social circle or footing. Um, and then there's these kind of strange, unexplained things that happen in the novel. A lover who says he's separated from his wife and disappears and starts ghosting the narrator when she texts him. A uh, bookseller who's attacked mysteriously, and it seems to be related to another potential attack. Uh, you're never quite sure. A man with this lustrous head of hair uh, who tries to pick up the narrator at a party and then turns up out to be the defense lawyer of the war criminal, the pres former president of an African country who's being tried in the court. And if you're like, what? Uh, so my question really at this point was, how do these enigmatic plot factors and loose ends um, intersect with untranslatability or, or just ununderstandability, uh, yeah. this kind of being at sea or, or ethical decenteredness? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, first of all, you know, going back to your, your starting point of there kind of being always this double interpretation that the character is doing, you know, I think that that sense of, of there being, you know, multiple layers to every communication, you know, there's a thing you intend to say, there's a thing you actually say, and there's a thing that you even don't know you want to say, for example. I think as a writer, I'm always very, very conscious of all of those layers, and I'm always trying to locate them in any scene. I mean, I'm really interested in contradiction and dissonance. Um, you know, I think those are the moments when characters reveal themselves. Um, you know, and in, I think earlier you had a, um, a phrase, I wrote it down, plurilingual subjectivity. And I think that's, that's really where this character explicitly, but I think in some ways all my characters really emerge from, they come kind of, to me, they come, come out from between languages. Um, and I think some of this is a result of my own upbringing, although, you know, I hesitate to make anything seem too biographical, but, you know, I, I grew up in a, in a dual language household. Um, and so from a very young age, I've always understood that there are things that can be said in one language that cannot be said in another language. Um, I've understood that character who you are varies and shifts according to what language you're speaking so I really noticed that with my parents who were native Japanese speakers who are fluent in English they appeared completely different they scanned as different people depending on what language they were speaking and I suppose the other thing I would say is that as a child growing up in a household where your parents 
are acquiring the dominant language of the culture, you really see how language dominance and power are just inextricable. Mm. Um, and you know, the person who can dictate what the language is, the person who dictates the vocabulary, that is the, that is the person who has power. And so it was always an experience growing up of seeing my parents rendered at times absolute authority figures to me as a child, but at other times completely powerless because of their lack of language. Um, so that sense of identity and character and personality shifting and falling apart, I think has always been very interesting to me and it's always been very much rooted in language. Um, I mean, in terms of the narrative and the structure of the plot, I mean, I, I would say that for me, one thing that I realized, I, I, I interviewed a number of interpreters when I was researching this book, and, and I also spent a lot of time reading transcripts from the International Criminal Court. And one thing I realized is that the interpreters always, although they were often there for many, many sessions, they always had a kind of partial apprehension of the full narrative. There was no sense in which they, mm -hmm. can, they understood the master narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and as I read the transcript, it felt more, the more, the deeper you go into the intricacies of the narrative, the more the totality of it starts to slip away. Um, and I think that's actually how many of us live in the world. I think we, we have pieces of the narrative, but never the full story. And so that happens throughout the novel. It happens with her partner, the, the one who kind of disappears for a while. There's always this sense that there are critical gaps, which are not dissimilar to the gaps in language that she experiences in her work as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I would say, I think we all live in that condition of not having the full narrative, which is why we are so compelled as a culture towards conspiracy theories and towards paranoia is because we desire the full narrative. But I think, you know, I think the narrator of, of this particular book is more comfortable with contingency. She has understood that that is not possible in some way. So she's much happier to move through the world um, where the kind of the plot doesn't resolve, so to speak, that 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 is very native to her in some way. It's interesting listening to you. I suddenly had my own flashback when I was just um, an undergraduate. I worked for two sociologists in Senegal and Algeria, and okay. they threw me in as a trans, sort of semi-professional translator for which I wasn't prepared at all at a conference that had, you know, mostly West African participants. And I remember the hardest thing about working as a translator, interpreter, was trying to understand what people say. I understood the language, but the idea, you know, it's, it's, it's trying to read someone's mind and actually understand what people are saying, which of course bounces back to, do I understand anything? What do we pick up? What do we understand? Yeah. And there's a wonderful scene in the book. Uh, I don't know why I just fixated on it, um, but it, I'm going to jump ahead in our discussions. It's that one where she's on a tram mm. and um, it, she's over, trying to figure out, she's studying Dutch and she's trying to figure out if she's hearing something correctly, she's listening to teenagers. So this, she's out of the context of the professional translator. Um, and I wondered if you could actually read this. For sure, us. yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah. Um, so so it, it's, 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 it's- Two or three say, tram stops later. Yes. Um, two or three tram stops later, I thought I heard one of the girls saying verkakting, the Dutch word for rape. I looked up startled. My mind had started to drift and I was no longer following their conversation as closely as, as I had been when I boarded. The girl who spoke was perhaps 12 or 13 years old. Her eyes were rimmed with heavy liner and she had a nose piercing. She continued speaking. I heard the phrase bell de politi, or I thought I did. But then the girl she was speaking to began giggling in response. And after a moment, the girl with the nose piercing also began to laugh. And I was no longer certain of what I had heard. After all, rape and calling the police were not exactly a laughing matter. The girl with the nose piercing must have felt my gaze. Abruptly, she turned and stared at me. And although she was still laughing, her eyes were hard and empty, entirely mirthless. Yeah, so, so many things struck me re when I read this. Um, I loved 
I, I found that the whole theme of invasiveness was weirdly echoed by the motif of the punk girl's nose piercing. And then started to pick up on the kind of imagery of piercing and breaking in all over the place. The term in German, verkachting, uh, means broken up. Um, and it's so it's not, but then you think of rape and breakage and invasiveness. Um, it's all in this continuum, obviously. Um, and she's breaking into another language, Dutch, which she knows less well than German. And it seems kind of fun and, and, and innocent, this exercise of, of sort of snooping or listening into somebody to get your language skills better. And then suddenly it's like finding uh, on a tape, you know, evidence of a murder, somebody screaming in the background, she's implicated mm -hmm. in some way. And this is something that the, the novel is constantly doing in the courtroom as well. It's that you're kind of a neutral bystander, right? You're this bystander translator who's not supposed to have um, some form of, of, you know, agency in the situation directly. And then, but here she is, you know, what does she do? references to rape police does she go to the police does she intervene and what's also very unsettling uh afterwards in this in, in this passage is the fact that there's this after the terms rape or illusion to a sexual assault there's giggling there's this kind of nervous giggling and then when the the, the girl with the piercing looks is confronts the um, narrator with her gaze, she's, it's, it's this feeling of almost laughing while mirthless. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's very unsettling. It's that kind of mixed emotions. And it, to me, this was a kind of mask or portrait of the, um, the ways that being in translation are constantly slipping you up. It's like um, sometimes you get, for example, if you're translating, you, you catch the cognate uh, but it's a false friend. It leads you to the wrong path, or it's a, what they call in French a contresens, a a, in fact, a reversal of the very thing it seems to sound like. Uh, and so you're being, in a sense, dispatched onto these very treacherous paths when you get involved in translation. Your own responsibility and implication are, are often very uh, um, impossible to know. And that whole kind of force field of unknowability then becomes very palpable in that throughout the book, but in this passage for me, especially. I, I mean, Emily, thank you so much for, for re reading my work in this incredible way. I mean, it, it's, you know, I mean, I, I guess there are two things. One is exactly that I wanted to capture that kind of disjunction in the, in the sense that there are all these signifiers whose meaning don't cohere into a single meaning for, for the narrator. And so it's, it's constantly her understanding of what, of what is happening is being you know revised, 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 and then ultimately the pieces don't add up and she's kind of paralyzed by that. Um, and then you know the other thing that I think, as, as you said, the scene is about is, is about witnessing and what the ethical dimensions of that are. And, you know, for me, if, if, if I were, before I started writing the book, I think I, want, I thought I wanted to write a, a novel about complicity. And so this is a character who has been trained to think of herself as neutral. This neutrality is very important to her work. Um, and over the course of the novel, she begins to understand that that neutrality is, at least to some extent, it's a performance. It's a kind of useful fiction because it, gives a sense of impartiality to the institution of the court as well as the justice that it meets out. Um, and it, it, it's, it's part of the kind of power of the court in some way, this so-called neutrality. Um, and so again, in this scene, she is witnessing something. Um, and I think when we talk about witnessing, we often think about the witness as almost impartial, that you're, you're presenting evidence in some way, but you know, ev every witness comes with their own subjectivity and their own consciousness, their own history of prejudices and presuppositions. And I think she, she ultimately no longer, she loses her ethical compass at various moments in, in, the, in the novel. But I think actually in a way that is potentially, if not useful, is at least more truthful to, to her experience. So it's, it's, she's constantly confronting this break, breakdown of meaning 
um, or she also loses maybe. all sense of boundaries between yeah. um, the protocols of the courtroom and life and other people also uh, in a sense infringe the boundaries so for example keys who's yes. this um, defense attorney comes on to her at one point and his body language is so threatening that it almost feels like a kind of replay of that scene that she's overhearing that you feel like there's going to be a potential sexual assault or some form of violence uh, and and the violence is subterranean it's just constantly circulating it, it comes from the um the president who looks at her and then at times tries to seduce her and his charisma is sedu seducing his followers and some of the people listening in and so there's this mixture of this real tension between seduction and violence that which is never exploited fully it simply lowers under the surface of the language mostly and and in some of the descriptions everything's understated but i found it more of a charge as a result of that it, it was interesting because you know i i wrote the first draft of the book and then i went back and i read it and i realized that there was there were just vast amounts of sexual harassment and sexual intimidation yeah. throughout the novel. Yes. She, she goes to a museum and the, the painting that she's captivated by is, is, a, is, a, is a very famous Jew, the Leicester painting, which is called The Proposition, which is of a, of a man who's propositioning a young woman who clearly does not want his attention is a wrong word. He, she doesn't want him there. Um, and, and I, you know, I think ultimately it felt, it, it was part of the, the project of making this the entire setting of the city, everything kind of uneasy. And it was also just, I mean, I think it's very hard to write about power without writing about gender to some extent. And I think sexual harassment is of course about power rather than desire. So I think, although there is this kind of element of seduction and charisma, I think it's also, that's to me, that's a little bit the, the surface or the, the cover for what is actually just a blunt assertion of power in almost every single case, you know, whether whether it's it's case the the defense attorney or whether it's a former president, this is this is about exerting power. But there is this kind of veneer of seduction in order to make it to to create a, a kind of narrative diversion, if if, if that makes sense. I think so, we're almost at. I think we're at our time as well. But I just was there's one say. quick uh, thing I wanted to maybe throw out, and maybe people can pick up on it on the conversation as well, which is um, the whole way in which the, the write, writing creative prose is a form of ventriloquism. It's a form of being a chameleon. And Lydia Davis talks about this as, in relation to the art of translating and says, well, it's a relief when I'm translating because I'm I, I I can be a ventriloquist and a chameleon. But my feeling, especially reading, both of you as writers do a kind of thinking translating and use translation as material for narrative form. And it's something in between. It's not translating proper. It's not. Um, but what it brought out for me was the way in which fiction writing is about this space that of not just ventriloquism but also of a sort of division between um i mean what what's interesting about translation is it's a kind of author authorized plagiarism mm -hmm. um so it's almost a stronger version of the fictive project right which is also authorized stealing from people's mm -hmm dialogues, you know, overhearing and transferring. There, there's a kind of relationship between translating and writing on the one hand, and also um, a way in which the, a book about translation stands in for the writer. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's the final issue, which is a sort of separate one, which is the translator as the effaced presence historically in literary history who's left whose presence mark people who are marketing fiction don't want to pay attention to they want to uh, keep them off the cover or historically you know women were translators in the 19th century most of the 19th century french classics were a lot of them had women translators who were unacknowledged or um, i mean Madame Bovary was translated by Karl Marx's daughter, Eleanor, um, and 
her wonderful, fascinating preface to the first edition was just lopped off. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so it's interesting. There's a kind of, there, there are a number of different things going on here, but I think we're probably getting close to the end. But I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think for me, there's a, there's a reason, you know, in both this, this novel and in my previous novel, the figure is a translator rather than an author. I think the mm -hmm. more obvious thing um, for a writer, maybe particularly of my generation, but I don't know, would, would be to have the, have the, to kind of go in a more directly autofictional route perhaps, or, or just to have a, just have a writer rather than you have a translator. But I think, you know, I've, I've always had a troubled relationship to authorship in some really fundamental way. And I've always been interested in, in how you can loosen the authoritative grip on a, on a text in some way. Um, I mean, which is part of why I find reading your work so invigorating is because I think you're positing translation as a way of opening up our notions of authorship and of kind of adding in layers. Oh, I, I should stop talking. I want to hear both. No, I want to hear both of you keep talking for hours. I'm um, so sorry. No, not at all. Um, we have a couple questions, um, but I do encourage everyone in the audience to keep putting your questions in the Q and A. Um, I'm going to start with um, a question from Allison, um, which is about tone and how tone is used effectively in translating the texts. Emily, do you have thoughts about? Um, tone is really fascinating because uh, it's both loudness, right, and then emotional tone and texture, and it's also this area where especially, we're especially conscious of now, um, of if, where microaggressions can occur, uh, it's where the wrong tone can, if you're trying to capture something from another culture is really falls flat um, and, and, and creates the, the greatest sort of sense of infidelity to the original. If you don't get the tone right, you kind of don't get the book right or the text, uh, you, you kind of lose it. At the same time, if you think, if you truly believe you're matching the tone, you're probably deluding yourself. And you could be doing more harm than good. There's a so there is a kind of constant self critique and humility and tone is like you know people say poetry is impossible to translate. Uh, well, uh, it's it is really hard. I've I've tried it a little bit here and there, but not for not professionally. But if you're doing it in live translation, tone. It can you know the the person being translated people can actually hear the disparity um, and let's not even get into the fact that many languages are tone languages so which and I, this this brings us to the the kind of musicality the the element of orality that mm -hmm. it's um, sometimes very important for writers to try to convey i don't know katie if you grappled with that. I mean, it's interesting. I was thinking about what, when you were talking about t voice and tone in, in spoken interpretation, you know, I, I when, when I spoke to various interpreters, one, one thing that I realized was that tone is, is everything, tone is part of meaning as, as well. So like the kind of most obvious example is if somebody says something in, in, in their testimony that is ironic, if you don't convey that irony, you're actually flipping the meaning completely you're not conveying the meaning so so there's actually something that's deeply performative about the work that an interpreter does I think they need to perform the language that they are transmitting from place to place um, in, in terms of written text I, I I remember a really interesting conversation I had with Damien Searles who, who's a wonderful translator and works in so many languages like six or seven different languages but in this particular instance he was talking about um, translating Elfriede Jelinek the Austrian writer mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and it's it's actually was so incredibly complicated because he was saying that the, one of the great challenges of interpreting Jelinek is to capture the dissonance that is inherent to her language and not make it seem like an artifact of translation so that the reader understands that that is, that is primary, that is not part of 
part of the kind of you know friction translation that I've been talking about. And so I think there's so many incredible complexities, but um, I suppose just on an anecdotal level, I, I would say that I had said to my French editor that I, I thought I imagined that my text was very, my novels were very easy to translate because there are no big words. I don't know what I thought. I just said, I think they're probably very easy to translate. They're quite short. And she said, they're actually kind of a nightmare to translate because the tone, I think it, it Emily, I think it's what you, you said is that it already feels like it's come through translation or that's what I hope. Mm -hmm. And so then to, to put it through translation again, it, it, I, think, I think that's where things get really difficult with, with literary translation and possibly. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Um, this question from Rachel is to both of you, what do you think is the place of performance and performativity in translation and interpretation? Um, do you want to jump into that, Lisa? Uh, Katie? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, Rachel, thanks so much for that question. I mean, I, I'm fascinated by performance, I think, in general. It's something that I, I think about a lot. I'm, I think about my characters as constantly performing their identity and I'm interested in the places where that performance breaks down. I mean, as, as I said, when I interviewed these interpreters, one thing that I realized is that I actually had certain character elements slightly off. I, I think I thought of the interpreters as being um, in some way, some way uh, self-effacing. You know, Emily, as, as we discussed so much of the kind of role of interpretation, it, there is this kind of strange present but not present quality to, to, the, to the figure of the translator and the figure of the interpreter. And I think that's absolutely true, but I think the irony is that in order to enact that present, not present, they actually need to perform quite a lot. So they, are, they have to interpret the work, literally interpret um, in the sense of you interpret a role or you interpret a piece of music, they need to interpret what is being said and, and perform it and bring it to life in order to convey its full meaning. So I think, um, I think that element of it, I realized seemed to be incredibly physically exhausting as well. It, it's, it's, it's a kind of multi-layer performance. In terms of translation, that's such an interesting question. And I, Emily, do you have, do you have thoughts? Well, that? when I was working on this dictionary of untranslatables, um, the model for a history of philosophy or an encyclopedia of philosophy was, as I mentioned earlier, it was concept history. So you take truth or you would take, um, um, you know, some, some eternal concept that, that was like a, from the Greeks to the mm -hmm. present and you would trace it in a, in a rather static, non-performative way. And the idea of the dictionary, we didn't always succeed, but it was to, how would you do a performative philosophy uh, through using tr translation? How would you, and, and the, the term that Cassin used was energia, it was a Greek term that languages acquire life or energy, mm -hmm. they be, and they acquire in J.L. Austin's sense of a performative force, mm -hmm. the force of a promise or, or a prayer or, or a binding contract. They, they acquire that force um, through, through, through being put into a living, active, mm -hmm. dynamic situation. So you can say that, you know, it's part of a, a, a philosophy of translation to, to give this kind of energy. Um, but there's also the performativity of the courtroom. The courtroom, which yeah. is not animate, create, is another factor in translation. And Katie and I had talked a lot about, um, I, I had in mind Bruno Latour's wonderful ethnography of the Conseil d'État, which was the, you know, the, the legal chamber. He does a whole early book, a study of this. And the furniture, the, 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 these non-human actors sort of perform as part of the judicial setting. setting. They give solemnity. They give a, a kind of um, binding force to the verdict. It's the setting which performs as well, uh, you know, it's, which is part of the theatricality. Um, the, there are these inanimate actors and or, or interpassive uh, delegates. And uh, so we were discussing this in terms of the, 
um, or the, you know, Sarah Ahmed uses the term, the phenomenology of the institution. These are all expressions that allude to non-human um, actors that create a sense of performance that, and we really shouldn't just isolate speech. Yes. Um, and that, and part of what Katie's novel does that I absolutely love was that the translator's booth with its two, I think it's a one-way mirror and the way in which people can see or not see and everything. Mm -hmm. The booth, which is like a kind of character that moves through the novel and adds to the performative dimension. Okay. Thank you both. Sorry, Katie. No, go. Um, I was just going to thank you both um, for this wonderful conversation. Um, and sorry to the questions that I wasn't able to get to. There's so much to talk about with all of this. Um, wish I could hear you guys talk about this for the next three days. Um, but sadly, we cannot. Um, but what everyone can do is come to our bookstore, kind of go to our <laughs> website, buy all, every book that Katie and Emily have written, um, and join us back here another time. Um, Thank you again to Katie and Emily. Thank you to Bruce um, and to our Zoom audience and have a really great night. Thank you, Eliana. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Bye-bye.